Okay. Hey. All right, we got a good crowd going on. Good. That's great. Thank you, everyone, for uh, sticking around this late in the day, this mid part of the, of the Design Summit. Uh, I want to talk to you today about creating custom disk image builder, or DIB for short, elements. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about DIB. But first, who the heck is this guy? Uh, you know me from OpenStack. Uh, I've been working in the community since 2012, uh, previously at AT&T, now currently at Cisco, where I do a bunch of stuff. And uh, this is me from Atlanta. So let's talk about Disk Image Builder. What? First of all, like I said, Disk Image Builder is an OpenStack project for creating images, uh, not, not pictures. We're talking about disk images for guest operating systems. Uh, the whole project is broken up into a series of elements that can be pieced together to do uh, lots of interesting things. Uh, the real beauty of Disk Image Builder is that it's scriptable, it's repeatable, it's automated, and uh, it's, it's really, really awesome. So why do we want to do customized disk images? You know, well, on, obviously, uh, not everybody wants to use the generic vendor-supplied images. Uh, you know, you might have to do things like uh, specifying your own NTP servers or security uh, protocols or, you know, you may want to standardize your access across all various distributions instead of logging in as Ubuntu or logging in as Fedora for different, um, different distributions. So, uh, I took a survey a few months ago of the OpenStack operators community and the responses were awesome. A whopping 93% of the respondents in the ops community customize disk images. 7% use stock generic vendor supplied images. So the drill down was what is being done inside customized disk images? Uh, we see here infrastructure, internal infrastructure requirements by far and away is the most popular reason for custom customized disk images. Um, things like uh, name servers, internal domain, internal NTP. I know this is all stuff that can be gleaned from DHCP, but it's not, not always there all the time. So that's internal requirements is num number one reason. Package needs, performance tuning, and the smaller ones there is file system layouts and users and permissions. So that's kind of the reason why you would want to have a customized disk image. So let's back up real quick and talk about, real quick, what Disk Image Builder is. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to just create like Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, CentOS, RHEL, and OpenSUSE images initially for bare metal use. And there's an element for creating virtual machine images for use, you know, in glance. And, uh, and that does things like set up the partition in the file and modifies the bootloader. Um, you can see there, there's an example. You can throw in various architectures. And the way you call it, the disk image create, you just name the elements. In my instance here, I would be creating a 64-bit Ubuntu uh, 1404 virtual machine disk image for using Glance. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is, there's a lot of customizations we want to do for our disk images. How do we go about creating disk images? What are all the tools? So um, in Paris, I briefly talked about the variety of tools that there are available. And I think most of them come down to four major groups, and Dib, Packer, VM Builder, and Box Grinder. Now, the beauty of Dib, being an open, uh, an open stack project, is um, it's got that really fast release cycle, really fast feedback loop. Uh, bugs get reported. Uh, we are, with the exception of the week of the uh, summit, we're getting at, at least one commit in master every week uh, as per GitHub. So we are a very active project. Uh, yeah. um, Packer, Packer is hosted on, uh, on GitHub. It's pretty active, um, but you know, um, Mitchell is busy with a lot of other stuff, so he's not <laughs> merging all those pull requests all the time. Uh, VM Builder, I checked. It's still kind of um, uh, it's it's still active, but it's kind of hard to compare Launchpad and GitHub activity. So I don't know. 
Uh, Packer's actually slowing down a bit. Uh, since October of 2014, uh, there hasn't been very much activity. And unfortunately, Box Grinder is dead. Long live Box Grinder. Um, <laughs> Um, one of the best reasons why Disk Image Builder is uh, my choice of, of a creation tool is it doesn't rely on underlying virtualization technology. Uh, Packer is a, a VM that imitates a kickstart or a dead bootstrap, and VM Builder is the same thing. Uh, it spins up a VM. It's great if you're on bare metal, but if you're already virtualized, you have this nested virtualization problem, and now you're taking 20, 30 minutes to build a single disk image. Um, so DIB, is, it works completely in a Cheroot environment, uh, along with, as this box grinder. Now, with, with DIB, I can make all of the major Linux distributions, and there's rumor of Windows being able to work. Um, Packer does have an advantage that any OS can be installed because it just imitates the user action. So if, if it has a, an installer, you can kind of imitate it, you know, somebody typing in on the keyboard. Um, and Box Render obviously only worked on Fedora and, what, you know, RH-based. Uh, obviously, one of the cool things is anybody can work pretty much. If you know Bash and if you know Python, then you can come work for Dib. You know, you, you don't have to learn Go or, or whatnot. And as I pointed out, the, the, the installation method is uh, a modification kind of uh, paradigm where we take the existing vendor-supplied disk images as the, um, as the source, we, we expand it out, we blow it up, and then we chroot into the environment to do the, the element uh, modifications inside instead of running through uh, an installer. So. How do we work with, uh, you know, now I know how to do um, Disk Image Builder, but how do I make my own element? What's the, you know, where would I put my secret sauce? So obviously the first thing you want to do is keep your configuration stored in some kind of config management system so you don't have a single point of failure if your laptop dies. Uh, you, want to, you want to use um, a prodigious use of environment variables because Disk Image Builder is highly tunable. You can just run the same command and just tweak a couple of environment variables and now you're making you know, Fedora 19 instead of 21. So it's very cool. Um, you create your own elements that they're stored in Git and you just pipe them on to the list of, of uh, commands that, um, that you're passing the, the Disk Image create. So for example, uh, I have an element called MooCow. Uh, I think MooCows are cool. You set an environment variable called elements path that includes where your thing is located. Just, my, just like you would you know, export path, you export elements path. And now you can just tack on your custom elements to the end of the, of the command list and you'll get your thing. Let's see what uh, compo comprises an element. Uh, it's a really intuitive to look at once you start um, kind of looking into it. There's, you can have a bin if you have any, any scripts that your element references. And there's a really slick uh, order of operations that happens. Um, it's really self-explanatory. It's really well documented. Um, some of the stuff happens before a cheroot. The majority of the exercises happens inside of a cheroot. And then it exits cheroot uh, to do any, any finalizations and, and uh, you know, clean up items. So um, pre-install, install, all those happen inside a cheroot environment. Uh, the root.d, that happens before the cheroot happens. That's where you, you download the image uh, from the upstream. Sorry, I can't hear myself. Okay. So, um, sounds good. Um, it's, it's a really fast uh, process. Uh, it's it's prone to parallelization. I can do, in, um, in my environment, I can do all the major uh, Linux distributions uh, and you know, current version and previous version. All the images can be built in about six minutes flat. Uh, so it's, it's really cool when you parallelize it. So uh, we're going to go ahead and do a little bit of a demo. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Uh, 
One sec. Okay, so here's a demo I recorded earlier. Uh, this, this is, <laughs> here I go doing disk image create. Uh, I'm gonna do a 64-bit, uh, I'm gonna do a Fedora, and it's a QCAT2 image, and I'm gonna make, I call out my first element, it's Fedora, and I wanna do a VM for, for a virtual machine. Right away, it goes out, checks the upstream, uh, the vendor supplied image, it realizes, hey, um, it hasn't changed, and it starts going through its list of dependencies. Um, it starts installing the packages, modifying the bootloader, up, uh, it's actually updating the bootloader, it's um, going through the base element, which is uh, something they all have in common, uh, and then it's going and just going through the, the Red Hat common stuff. So all of the Fedora images, CentOS, and, and Enterprise Linux ones are all gonna get the same kind of base level of, uh, of packages installed. Like there goes SE Linux, there goes, you know, Dracut, and, and, and this happens every single time a, a image gets built. So it's always gonna get the same set of updates uh, whenever. So you never accidentally forget to apply patches or, or whatnot. Um, it goes through, this actually takes about two minutes. Let's go ahead and skip, oh, there it goes. Uh, there goes the cleanup process. Uh, I don't install the, <laughs> I didn't install the, uh, the language set, so it's got no need to remove it. And, you know, let me skip ahead a bit. Here is at the end, it's going ahead and converting it to um, uh, running the, the SE Linux, uh, there it goes converting to QCOW2, and that's basically the end of creating an image. So the demo that I have set up is, is obviously you're here to see a custom demo of, um, of some kind of, of image customization. So what I've done right now is just taken the generic upstream Fedora uh, guest image and run dib on it to, to kind of do the... Uh, Slicing and dicing of the uh, uh, of the pack of of the original image. So, updated some stuff, updated packages, upgraded the bootloader, reconfigured it, run some some the, of the base element stuff, and it's it's pretty much done. But what I wanted to show you is customization. So, we've gone ahead and created a file called fedora.qcow2. Um, now, let's go ahead and look inside there. So there's, there, there it is, the file, fedora.qcow2. Uh, I'm gonna fire up Guestfish, just for a little introspection. Um, let's go fire, fire it up. And this doesn't take very long either. One of the common, um, one, one of the real easy things to do is, wh what I wanna do is, I like to change the message of the day. So people log on, they know what's going on. So the default image doesn't come with a uh, MOTD set. So I have this, this demo element, let me check it out. Uh, all I do here is in the post install, in the post install section, I'm gonna run a script that modifies MOTD. Real simple, I'm gonna get today's date, and then I'm gonna echo out, this image was created with this image builder on this date. So I'm gonna go ahead and set the environment variable, elements path, to you know, whatever it was before, and then just append my present working directory, because that's how I work. Uh, I'm sorry, I typed slow. <laughs> okay, so now I have an element named demo in the path. So I, I run again, disk image create, same command I ran before. Let's do the same architecture, AMD64. Now you notice I made a typo.
So I, I append demo. Oh, crap, I don't know how to spell, so uh, let me fix that real quick. OK, so there it goes. Now, one of the beautiful things about Disk Image Builder is that it employs a heavy amount of caching. So the first time you run it, you're, you're at the mercy of your pipe to download the, the, in the initial seed image from Fedora or for CentOS or Ubuntu and all the packages. But it builds a cache. So the second time, the third time, you just, you just iterate so much faster. The first time you run an image, it may take you 20 minutes. The second time, you're going to do it in like two and a half minutes. Uh, not only does Disk Image Builder cache the, uh, the root disk image files, it also maintains a cache of an apt cache and a yum cache. Um, so all these packages are already on my VM. They're just being, you know, hey, same thing, no need to download, saves on your bandwidth. It's, it's, it's really slick. Um, so let's go ahead and kind of skip forward to the end a little bit. Um, okay, we're doing the, uh, the SE Linux uh, context there. Let's skip forward a little bit. Okay, we're doing the QCAD2 conversion. Uh, and I understand I don't have to do this, but I, I didn't want to fill up my, uh, my VM with uh, more than I had to. So it's, it's converting to QCAD2. And as soon as that's done, let's go ahead and go inside the image and see um, if that demo element gets applied. Now, if you remember, the demo element was just a simple shell script, gets today's date, and applies a message in uh, etc MOTD. OK, it's done. So let's go back into Guestfish. Let's boot up the image. Uh, not a QCAT2 image. If I convert it to raw, I can just mount it. That's MOTD, and this image was created with Disk Image Builder on yesterday. So that was like the hello world of disk image uh, elements. Uh, it's, it's really easy to do. Um, you can do it in any, any language that, that you like. Um, so, you know, if, if uh, I can find my cursor again. I don't know if that, uh, if that shows up very well. OK, so pretty much a anything um, that you can write in Shell or, or Python or Ruby can be implemented into, into Disk Image Builder. So you know, again, show you the elements file here. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a simple shell script uh, and gets executed uh, because I called it at the end of, of the command, and, and simple as that. You know, you can even do more complicated things like um, some of the things that we have uh, internally, uh, one of my desires was to have, um, I, I want to have every different version of Linux use the same user. You know, because I think it's ridiculous that some user, some disks, you, you log in as Fedora, sometimes you log in as, as Ubuntu. So what I did is in, in the post install, I, uh, I just go in and I have this little Python script that modifies cloud.cfg and makes the default user be cloud user. So now anybody who uses our, um, our, our Cisco images um, for, our, for our product offering has a consistent kind of access entry. So you know, that's one less thing for other automation that they don't have to worry about. You know, it's it's going to be cloud user for all your Linux systems. And uh, hopefully, your Windows can do this as well. And that was uh, Python, right? Yeah, yeah, that's Python. Um, you know, that's super simple, uh, scriptable, automatable, repeatable disk image creation. Uh, disk image builder, 
you know, check it out on, uh, download it from, you know, install it with pip or check it out from GitHub. Uh, you, you can do it in Vagrant. You can do it on, I think you can do it on OS X even, as long as you have uh, the necessary, you know, if you have brew installed, you can probably do it. So Disk Image Builder, it's, it's awesome. Um, check it out. Uh, start creating images. And uh, you know, I'll take any questions if anybody has them. Okay, so the post install uh, stage happens inside a Cheroot environment. So you're going to use relative paths for for so. If you're going to modify MOTD, for example, you would say <laughs> slash Etsy slash MOTD because you're inside a Cheroot environment. Does that kind of answer your question? Well, let's think about the link. So, like, if I, I don't know, use Go or like, I'm putting my own image. So, you would, you would have that as part of a package install. And, and that is actually, um, for example, if, if we were to look at a package installation, you just specify a YAML file with the things that you want that don't come in the, in the generic vendor supplied images. So you would just say like, and now you have Go. But I don't want Go. Yeah. Uh, John. I do do testing. Um, I do very, uh, very generic unit tests, uh, kind of assertion tests. So I have, you can see right above the line, I set some repositories, I do some IPv6 stuff, um, I set the time zone, et cetera, et cetera. So when I run this, this thing, um, I, wrote a, I, I just wrote a test script. Now, uh, I'm converting this to run in uh, guest guestfs, but when I wrote it initially, it's running on, on Ubuntu, and Ubuntu has this really nice uh, kernel module for NBD. So what I do is just mount up a, mount up a QCAT2 image in, in NBD, and then root into the image, and then just run a series of assertion tests. Like, you know, is UTC, did UTC actually get set? Yes. Some of the packages, you know, did Crony actually get installed? Yes. You know, uh, did we actually change the, uh, the, the, the user. Did this, uh, the bin utils package actually get installed? You know, so that's, that's the assertion test that, that I have uh, in there to, to kind of test the image. Now, when I convert this uh, kind of real generic uh, primitive test to do guestfs, uh, that'll actually test the bootability of the image for, as well, and that allow me to be more, uh, you know, have a, like the semantic guys were saying, have a higher probability of success when I launch an image. So, uh, the, uh, well, in this example, the tests are being run on the build server. That's awesome. That's even easier. In the back. Do you have any advice or best practices on when you end up with like hundreds of elements as far as organizing them? Oh, well, dependencies. Um, so one of the things that you don't see here is um, this is under the hood. Everything is going to call. But if, if you look at it, your, your element, for example, for <laughs> Fedora, you just you set all of the things that re are required by it. So you know things like Red Hat Common, Yum. That way you don't have to kind of pony uh, along all the things. So in my in my custom element, you know I I want to I want to bring in for example. I want to modify the order in which data sources are, are fed to, to, dis, uh, to cloud in it, so I bring that in as a dependency. You know, I also um, want to bring in the package mapper and, um, and the, the installer. So, so 
once you have like what your image is going to be, then all the things that you want to add on to that can be put into the element dependencies file. It's a great question. Let me let me show you real quick. Um, uh, so my build script, for example, um, uh, real real easy, real easy. I set there's this environment variable called the release. Uh, first, I set it to precise. Uh, actually, by default, it's set to trusty for the Ubuntu element, so it's going to make a 1404. Then I set it to precise, and then it's going to make a 1204. So then I, uh, for example, it's, it's not always code words. Um, Fedora 20 is the, is the default version of the Fedora element. But if I set the release at 21, it's going to make the, uh, the next version of it. And um, not all of the elements use the release for the version. Actually, they do. You know, not, that not all of them do. Like so Fedora, if you set the release to 21, it'll make a Fedora 21 image. You know, but the, the Ubuntu elements are pretty slick because you actually use the code name. So, you know, dib release equals precise. Dib release equals um, whatever <laughs> trust, um, what's after trusty? Quantal. I also know about how do you manage the dependencies on Okay. Um, so you're saying like if uh, if I'm working in in like a Red Hat six for example, it has a different version of um, one of the things that you do is is you can look for the environment variable being set in in your script. So you say like if dib release equals rel six for example, then you do this custom Python two point six stuff that you have to do. Otherwise, you exit cleanly and continue on. So this is all like everything is, is pretty much driven by the absence or presence of an environment variable um, that is named after the element that you're using is one method that I do. Because I do, I do two versions of each distribution. Yes, the dib ar architecture is also an environment variable that you can, that you can uh, query. So, Disk Image Builder, actually, it's a good question, uh, segue. Uh, Disk Image Builder supports i386, AMD64, ARM, and PowerPC. Uh, I think that's all of them. And, uh, and th this is all queried in, in the shell scripts by the value of the environment variable. So, for example, um, um, I, I call it like the, bin the bind utils package. In Ubuntu, it's called DNS utils. In Red Hat, it's called bind utils. Um, so, you, you, this is just a, a real simple, you know, YAML file that um, you know just kind of maps the uh, the family, and, and it also applies the same for service mapping. Um, so, if if you want to do any like check config kind of scripts in your post install. You just use a generic name and map the service. You know, this is, you know, it's Apache 2 in Ubuntu, and it's HTTPD in, in, in Red Hat. Um, can, you can you say it again? Oh, we, yeah, well, if you have, um, like, a local source, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's, this part isn't clearly documented, but, um, a lot of the times, you can just kind of point to an internal URL like you have here. I have this internal IP address, uh, and like that's the name of the file. I override the. So if I was just to run the the Red Hat um, make a Red Hat image thing, then it would ask me to have the my RHN credentials, so it could log into RHN and download the file. So I set that environment variable for where the local file lives, um, and that's. Really reduces your amount, your dependency on on externals. If you have, you know, things like Red Hat, for example, where you have to log in and, and download it. How big how big does your um, cache typically get? 
Excellent question. Uh, so I've done a couple of demos uh, here. Um, actually, let's just. Um, So for, for having done uh, a couple of Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu 14.04 and Fedora 20, uh, my cache is 1.1 gig. And that's including the upstream image uh, and the apt and slash yum caches, caches. So if, if you have a disposable environment, um, uh, so like if you're, if you're doing this as part of like a CI system, um, and you have a disposable environment, are there mechanisms that you can make that retrieval a little bit faster? Is that just pointing to all internal URLs for these? Uh, natively, I don't think there is a, a native cache primer. Yeah, well, so all the, that we get in the stream will pull the repository to you to download everything. Um, so basically, it's an indirect layer. So every time the W gets something and pulls it off the internet, we can override where it's grabbing that thing from. And so if you know the thing you can that be a file or like a repository? Yeah. Okay. The other thing that we do in Infra is we pre-populate our build nodes with the cache. So like we'll do a, a run on the node, have the cache on there, then when they boot up later, they have the cache pre-populated in. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you know, your Jenkins host has to, you know, never remove its home directory. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, last month I noticed that we had Red Hat 6, Red Hat 7, you know, Fedora that does 19, 20, and 21, but we only had CentOS 7. So I said, well, why can't we make CentOS 6? So we just go and make, uh, I copied the CentOS 7 element and changed a couple of bits did a little bit of tweaking for the, uh, the dependencies from the differences between Python 2.7 to Python 2.6. And with the help of the community, now we can make CentOS 6 images as well. It's, it's you know, it was really easy. We just make a new directory in, um, in, the, in, the, in the elements path. So this one right there, that didn't exist last month. And uh, I wrote that. <laughs> um, basically, I just copied this one and, and just did a couple of uh, bits of changing, and, and the community approved it, and now we have a new image. Um, you know, oh, I forgot to mention, OpenSUSE is also supported. I did run into huge dependency problems, specifically around Python version. Uh, so I, I ended up having to uh, import a whole lot of the, uh, the rel common, the Red Hat common sections, break them out, and put them locally into the CentOS 6 directory, um, directory really, just to, to make for the differences in, uh, in Python 2.6. I do, you know, that's one of the things that, um, because, because I've done a couple of, of different elements, both internally and publicly, I thought it would be kind of cool, uh, and maybe next week, I would write some kind of initialization thing where you can, you can just kind of like, you do like a vagrant in it, and it creates the, uh, the vagrant file for you. I think it'd be pretty cool to do a, um, a, a dib in it kind of thing, and it creates the directory structure for a new element. That doesn't exist yet, but I think that, uh, I honestly think that would be pretty easy to do and, and pretty helpful to get other people you just started in making their own elements. Good question. Well, if, if uh, nobody else has any questions, I really appreciate the crowd I have today. Uh, I'm actually surprised. I thought I'd have like four or five people at this hour. So uh, thank you very much. and. Uh, Check out the project online. Uh, talk to this guy as well. He's one of the major contributors. And um, oh, oh, Greg, Greg Haynes uh, from HP. Also, we got the, the project's actually mainly driven by HP, Red Hat, and Cisco. 